Welcome to Homemakers No Dig Market Garden Teaching Garden. It's coming up to the end of August and there's a lot to show you this time. If you haven't seen any or many of my tours before, we do these every month. You can subscribe to the channel, you'll get notifications. We do a lot of other things. There's ever so much going on here. As well as being No Dig, uh, there's a lot of different vegetables. We're going to see so many of them during this mini tour. And if you want to see it in person, we are having an open day here actually on Sunday, this Sunday, 3rd of September. Uh, today is Monday the 28th, I think it is, of August. So just to put that in the context, we're at the end of a summer when it has rained quite a bit. It's been wetter summer here than the last few. We've actually had around seven inches, 170 millimeters of rain in the last seven weeks and we've had some reasonable warmth. So it's abundance this year. And everything like here, in fact, in most of the garden, what you're gonna see is second plantings. So we've already had the broad beans and the peas and the onions and the spring onions and the spinach and the lettuce and the radish and the early turnips and the beetroot. And now, uh, for example, this was onions here where there's now kale. And at that end of the bed, there's leeks where there were potatoes. So with no dig, you can keep following rapidly. Uh, you don't have much bed prep to do. You can just pop in new plants. I'm not doing a strict four year rotation. I like to mix things up. That makes it actually a lot easier and you can have more fun. You can make your garden more beautiful. I would say you can see the flowers as well. They're not so much specifically designed as companion plants, but they are just beautiful plants. Uh, they help to bring in a few different insects and keep a nice balance. Of, of pest and predator. We've actually had this summer also a lot of swallows here. I had a swallow's nest in my barn. And every morning we go in, they're all busy chirping away and, and dropping poo on the floor. <laughs> and uh, I noticed though, they just left in the last couple of days. It feels rather empty and a bit sad in there now. So this is dig, no dig trial beds. And that's no dig, this is dig. I do the digging every December. It's one of the many trials I'm doing here. So far this year, we've had from the no dig bed, 50 kilos of vegetables, and from the dig bed, which has the same amount of compost, 44 kilos. And that's a pattern that I'm noticing pretty much uh, every year. This is year 11 of doing this trial. It's been a 12% difference so far over 10 years in favor of the, dig, the no dig with the same amount of compost. So no dig is a very efficient way of, of using compost. And you can see there's many more harvests to come, so it's not like a final result yet. Uh, all second plantings again. We're actually uh, going towards the greenhouse. I want to show you a bit more about propagation, but on the way, I could mention these beautiful vegetable here, which is chicory, because I think particularly in the UK, actually, they're not very well known. And I sowed these in uh, roughly the middle of June. And I, I tend to pull them up by the root for harvest. This is a one-off harvest of a head. You can see the, they look a bit nondescript on the outside. You can't really tell what's in there. But when you trim off these outer leaves, uh, this is a sign that they're a bit ready, actually. When you start to see these little side shoots coming out at the base, uh, would it, you could use these leaves, but I'm taking them off just to show you the beauty of this heart or head inside. That is a radicchio. So it's a variety called 506 TT. And if I cut in, you can see the, the gorgeousness of the heart leaves. And although they're slightly bitter because it's chicory, they're actually bittersweet because of the blanching effect of the folding in of that heart. Really nice plant to sow in July. So a lot of what is growing at the moment is it's about getting a decent <laughs> the right sowing date for the the plant. Um, these are the remains of some pak choy and, and mustards that we're not going to use now. Actually, we planted most of them. I'll hang on to the older plants in case I might need them. But here we've got current planting. So that's spinach. You could still just sow spinach for outside, uh, growing for growing outside, but also for growing under cover is very viable. This is interesting because you see some of them have come up really well and some haven't. 
Well, funnily enough, that's my home sow seed that <laughs> has not come up so well as the purchase seed, which is a variety called Amazon. I'm just trialing it. So I'm, I'm trying a lot of different seeds here uh, of spinach just to see some of them are red spinach. Um, some I've pricked out, some I sowed direct. All of that is possible. And this is salad rocket here. And yeah, that's pretty much it for the moment. You could still be sowing now though. At this time of year, late August is a very good time to sow spring onions. We would multi-sow them. We'll, so we'll put in eight spring onion seeds, even up to 10 in, in one of these little cells. And you're gonna get a little plug plant that you can put in the ground uh, with a bit more root on than that. Um, these were only sown a week ago, actually. So uh, spring onions, spring cabbage, spring cauliflower, or all possible to sow now and then lamb's lettuce, uh, land cress, Claytonia winter purslain, still sowings you can make if you've got empty spaces, you can sow them outside direct in your beds. And look what's here as well. We got two interesting things. One is asparagus. So that I sowed a little bit later than normal actually in April rather than February. I wouldn't mind if it was a bit bigger, but look at the root system it's got on it. So it's a very viable way to grow asparagus. You could do this next spring, for example. Um, my favorite time actually is with a bit of warmth in February and you can then get quite a big plant. We transplanted some in June and they're looking really good. Uh, so asparagus from seed and then chilies. Uh, there's a good old mixture here. That one <laughs> extraordinary. That came from real seeds and it's a variety called Bolivian Magic. So when they're unripe, they're purple. And then as they ripen, they go a bit orange. And then the really right ones go that amazing red. And each one of these packs quite a punch. <laughs> so we've been using those like on, um, I do lunches here, offer lunches for people on courses here. And Will, who was cooking yesterday, he put in three of those, I think. And that was quite enough for about 17 of us. This one it is uh, also a chili, believe it or not, called Anaheim. Because uh, we put that in a salsa we were making with tomatillo. And that's hotter than it looks. You know, it looks a bit like a pepper. And in fact, if you look up here, there's an amazing pepper called Astor. Um, I'm proud to show you this one because it's pretty much the one of a few. <laughs> I've not had a brilliant year for peppers here. It's just not been quite warm enough. Our summers are not hot. Uh, but if it's hotter in the greenhouse, so they're better in the greenhouse than in the polytunnel, for example. And one difficult thing with peppers, I find, is they make these long branches as you come towards the end of summer in particular, and they're, they're really coming to their own now actually. Uh, so I need to pick these yellow ones because then that will make space for the plant to grow more of the green ones. Uh, but you see how the branch gets quite long and then as the peppers grow and get heavy, uh, they pull it down and if you're not careful, they'll snap off. So I need to put another string in to support that one. Uh, you need to be on it, it I need to be on it, uh, keeping the support in place. <coughs> We've got, we do have amazing abundance at the moment. Um, just everything is looking strong. Beautiful French marigolds, <coughs> lettuce that we're picking regularly, fennel over there that we transplanted uh, a couple of weeks ago. So there's a lot been happening recently in terms of new plantings. Uh, chard, ruby chard that went in again about three weeks ago. And up there, we were picking it a bit already. Here though, we've got some squashes. And actually in the last video, I was showing the, the, the butternut squash, which hasn't really done it. But look at this, they are finally now making some squash. In fact, yeah, it looks like we're gonna make it in time. Butternut though is very much the last one to ripen here. I find it limit for the warmth we have we'll just about get ripe squashes there. Whereas this one, by comparison, that's Oregon Sweet Meat Homestead, making either one or two per plant. Really beautiful. Apparently they're very nice to eat. I've not grown them before. And this is the one that um, I have grown for and is particularly good flavor, Marina di Chogia. So when the leaves die off like this, that's actually a good sign of ripeness. You know, the butternut looks more healthy at the moment, but that doesn't mean to say it's necessarily going to do better in the end. Th these are good for, you know, late August. They, we're coming to the time when we want them to ripen. Skin get hard. What you're looking for there is that the 
stalk of the plant is going to be going a bit more yellow than that. So this is, I would say this is not ready yet. I'm not, not in any rush to harvest it. There's still a bit of green leaf and green stem. And I'm not worried about it sitting on the ground either. It's, it's just sitting on damp soil. That's totally fine. It's got a very hard skin, uh, which won't hurt for that. These are the tomatillos that we have mentioned a time or two in uh, previous videos. And what we've been finding is, well, we knew this would happen. <laughs> they fall on the ground. And then if you're not careful, there's one that's going a bit mushy. Uh, but I would still pick it up because inside each of these is like a million seeds. And that, if you leave them, that, that's, um, you know, that would be like a weed next year. Uh, but this one, though, that's feeling good and firm. And that will be nice to eat. Well, OK to eat raw. They are, they're particularly nice roasted. Um, we had a chef here last week, a um, week or two, actually, Dan. And he was doing some really nice roasted tomatillo, making salsas with that. These have been a star this summer. That's Aster Lady Coral Blue. I saved seed from it last year, actually. I need to look at doing a bit of that this year. There's, if, if, as long as it's not too wet, there's still a lot of seed saving you could do of flowers and things like marigolds as well. <clears throat> Here I just want to show you some recent planting we've done to give you an idea of how we do it. And this bed actually had purple sprouting broccoli in the spring. And then it's had lettuce all summer. And I was looking at the lettuce a week ago and I thought, mm, that could come out. And I was looking for somewhere to plant the spinach. So since the spinach all being well, we'll be cropping until next April or May. We put the compost on now and that will take the soil through the winter it's, it's feeding the soil which feeds the plants and so we then plant the spinach that that spinach went in three days ago and it's already I can see already it's growing so I'm putting plants in small that works really well they get away quickly and here look at these tiny little interplants so this is interplanting where you've got an existing vegetable already in this case is lettuce that we're picking the outer leaves so we're we picked the outer leaves three days ago on Friday that opened up the space a bit, made it easier to pop in these chervils. So that's chervil that was sown about a month previous. And that will take over from the lettuce. The lettuce will finish maybe in four weeks. Then we twist them out and all being well by, and then through October, even into November, we'll have some lovely chervil. These are beans that we saw last time. Uh, that's bolotis and they're looking good. The, the leaves again are starting to yellow, rather like the squash, that's a good sign. I'm happy to see that because that means that the plants are ripening and the seed pots will start to dry because we've only got another month really before I want to be harvesting them as dry pods. The compost making here is three pallet system is working very nicely. We're, we're, when, when I'm teaching compost making I say see if you can make a size of heap that you can fill within a couple of months and that way you can get a decent warmth so you'd need quite a big area though to fill a heap like this the size of a pallet just two wires on each corner very simple so this is the current heap and we're putting in a mix of green and brown so the brown in this case is some old wood chip you can still see bits of wood there like that for example that came from a tree surgeon that that is eight months old and still a bit of wood, but that helps to balance the green, which in this case is quite a lot of grass mowings. And the temperature you can see is pretty warm. It's over 50 degrees, which is actually just about hot enough to kill weed seeds. Not that I think there are many in here, but if I just lift a bit of this, you'll get an idea. You can see the steam coming out. I mean, that's largely that heat is through the grass mowings. If you've got a lot of grass, it's a great raw material for making compost, as long as you can add enough brown material to it. And then on the other side is the heap that finished two weeks ago. So that heap's two weeks since we started adding to it. Uh, I won't take the covers off, but basically you can see how much it sunk. It was up here two weeks ago and it's already gone down to that. It's the rather sad thing with making compost. You, you end up with less than you thought. And then this, this is two heaps in one here actually. So each of the side heaps we turn into this middle heap. And the temperature, this was turned about a week ago. 
and moved in here you can see it's still quite warm actually and that means that there won't be any worms yet i don't think because 35 degrees that's like almost a hot bath temperature yeah it's the raw material for worms they will arrive here for sure when it cools down a bit that's about three and a half months old so i'm pretty happy with what that looks like you know if you if you needed compost or you wanted to spread some and it looked like that you could use it at that stage it's it's that's very much decent compost but if you don't need it then keep a cover on it like we're doing there they'll keep out uh, the rain we might put some corrugated iron over these actually and just use it when you need it there's a gorgeous sunflower here tall orange sun Normally I deadhead this, my sunflowers so that they keep on making new blooms. But this one I couldn't resist leaving it, just partly because it's so big. But also it does look like it's going to make some nice seeds there actually. We'll see, I'm hoping. Uh, you know, it'll be good food for the birds and I'll keep a few for sowing. But look at that, just the way it does that. It's quite incredible. I do like sunflowers. And some people say they're allelopathic, which means... Uh, that other plants don't like growing near them but actually you can see that that's not true you know <laughs> it's more about they, they pump a lot of water out of the soil and so in a dry summer i do notice how plants close to the sunflowers are quite small but as a companion plant actually they're pretty nice there's a, another new planting here which is turnips so these are multi-sown turnips tokyo cross and they should crop by october and they're like much sweeter than the old traditional turnip uh, from japan i really like them for autumn then the mesh cover is about keeping off insects uh, there are actually a few few flea beetles got in there but mainly that's about insects and up there is onions going to seed so on my previous tour video in late july we saw the ones in the polytunnel which was the same onions put in at the same time and they've matured to seed already we've got some lovely dry seed from them for next year to sow next spring those ones are not ready yet that's the difference and in the summer we've had some of the seed we've been trying to save here outside has only just made it it's been marginal This is 11 year old asparagus, looking pretty strong. That has around an inch, two and a half centimeters of new compost every late October, November. After we cut down the tops, they die off towards the end of autumn. Yeah, I just wanted to show you the celeriac here because there are different ways to grow celeriac according to how much you prune or trim the leaves. And these, you can see, we have not touched them. Uh, I've been having problems in the autumn here, in late autumn, with septoria disease, which turns the leaves all brown quite quickly in humid weather. And I'm just wondering if leaving them alone <laughs> might give less point of entry to that fungus. Uh, we'll see, because we've got some up there that we are tidying up a bit more. They look much nicer if you take off the the leaves but you can see these nice looking celeriac they've had enough rain basically and likewise these you know this is uh broccoli that we haven't watered at all since it went in uh, thanks to the rain it's called tender stem and you can see they're making little heads already they've also got quite a few holes in the leaves and that i'm pretty sure that's from flea beetle because you can see that they're mostly on the edge we had a mesh over these until about 10 days ago and the flea beetles can chew through the mesh cover and leave a little hole, which as the leaf grows, turns into a bigger hole. So it's, it's not like a major problem, uh, just a bit annoying. All of you, everything you see here is second planting. And look at these cabbage here already. So that's granite red cabbage. And I planted those on the 9th of June after spinach. So that's a fantastic plant to grow. Uh, these, they were sown on the 4th of May. 
and they were sown at the same time as these cabbage here, which are filled a crack, and you can see they're going to mature a bit later. Uh, so if you get, these are a bit early actually, <laughs> I don't know if I want to eat all that red cabbage or I, I can sell it though and people like it for sure. We'll probably also do some pickles and, and preserves with it. Cabbage is such a useful thing. Um, these are actually, you know, if you want later cabbages, these savoys are brilliant for that. And they went in on the 17th of July, so that's about six weeks ago. In fact, it's precisely six weeks ago. They've been in the ground for six weeks and they had, uh, the same as those broccoli actually, they had a netting over I'd run out of mesh at this point <laughs> and the difference has been that there's more pest damage here we've lost a few plants to um, insects and some of them have been nibbled out even the heart leaf or uh, cabbage root flies you can see there's some gaps up there so that hasn't been all brilliant but actually there's enough here to do okay and it's a no rotation trial here actually as well that's ninth year of leeks in the same bed after potatoes there's lettuce after broad beans. There's parsnips after spring onions or intersown between them. And right at the top bed is squash. So that's curry squash, the lovely red ones. They ripen earlier, pretty much the earliest. If you're in a cooler climate and want to grow winter squash, they're a very, a very worthwhile option. Something else we've been up to recently is creating a new website and I hope you'll be pleasantly surprised <laughs> when you have a look. It's supposed to be going live. I say supposed to because you know I never never until it's there I'm never sure but it's 4th of September Monday 4th September. If you look at my website you'll see something new. And look at these pears as well so I'm not a brilliant fruit grower I would say I do my best and it's organic so we had quite a lot of aphid damage on these in the spring but the summer rain really helped them and it's a variety called Concord and then how do you know when they're ripe so I would not expect these normally to be ripe at this time of year what you do is you lift it up like that oh crikey that one has almost snapped actually not quite though see it's hanging in there that suggests it's getting close. <laughs> I wonder whether I should leave it or pick it. But when, when you pick a pear though, it's, it's not ripe. You pick them before they're ripe, that's the whole idea. When, when you lift it up like that, it tells you it's, it's ready to be picked and then you just keep it somewhere. If you keep it cooler, it'll take longer or in your house, a bit warmer, maybe it'll be ripe within a month maybe. But you've got to watch them. And you know, cause they, if you don't eat them before, when they're ripe, they, they then go over a bit. So there's some interesting fruit here, and this one I like, Coe's Golden Drop. And it really lives up to its name. It does look like a golden drop. And, oh yeah, there's, um, look at that, wasps. We got a lot of wasps this year, and that one's really going for it. It's where the pear started to rot, and I have noticed this actually. When they just start to rot like that, Luckily, they don't all do it, but if they do, uh, you've actually, it means you've got a nice ripe pear where it's not rotten. And that's what the wasp is after, the sugar behind that. But if you leave that rottenness, uh, this brown rot, we'd be getting this on apples too. And I know that quite a few people are suffering this and I don't have a remedy for it. I put this in the compost heap. I don't see anything wrong with doing that. I'll collect that one up later. But you can see it's, it's just occasional. It's not every fruit. And these these are remarkable because they hang here like this kind of looking ready and tempting for a long time but I've noticed this one feels soft could leave it actually a bit because you see how it wasn't that easy to um, pull off but I just wanted to show you what they look like when they're ripe another sign would be yeah, actually yeah look at that it's come away from the stone beautifully so I'm going to give share that with Nicola who's filming and just test this one myself what I have here actually, and I'll do that next time, is a bricks meter. Oh, that's delicious. It's not the sweetest, but it's beautiful flavor. And, and I hope it wasn't too loud in the microphone, but the texture is still very firm. Firm, but, but you know, really agreeable. Compared to say these Victoria, you can see they're super abundant. That's because actually we didn't thin them enough. <laughs> 
I, I wish I, we thinned them a bit more because what, what the result of that is we're asking this tree to ripen a lot of fruit with actually the leaves are not quite as bountiful as I'd have liked. And so uh, they're ripening more slowly than normally. They should be more ripe. But if, if I give the tree a shake, yeah, you'll see there's a few. I mean, this is, if, assuming you're going to eat them quite soon, doing that is one way to find the right fruit because they will fall off. So I hope you've enjoyed the tour and do have a look at my new website, uh, 4th of September. Maybe see you here on the 3rd if you live not too far away.